If you like Psych with Mike, here's a couple of ways that you could really help us out. You could subscribe to the show on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at Psych with Mike. But the two things that would really, really help us out is subscribing to us on YouTube, search Psych with Mike, but also going to Apple Podcasts and leaving us a review and a comment. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Nobody talks to you. Occasionally people talk to me. Sometimes people talk at me. Yeah. But the ones that are best are the ones that touch me. Oh, Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here on a day after Thanksgiving. So beautiful people, day yeah, in St. Louis. Who, yeah, who don't know uh, anything about how we record, and there's no reason why you should. Um, we are recording. There won't this, be a the, test afterwards. The yeah. day after Thanksgiving, and it is yeah. a beautiful day. Yeah, but I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm thankful. Thankful, and uh, you in our our pre. Uh, introduction banter you had said that you enjoy the power of touch I think touch is incredibly important and it's a challenging uh, conversation for a therapist to have because ethically we're not supposed to touch our clients Mm -hmm. because it can be misunderstood it can also be abused as a violation of trust if if you're touching someone to get your needs met right your needs for loneliness or contact or connectivity or what have you Um, so you have to be extremely careful about it but when you look at the more overall or all-encompassing issue of human touch it is one of the most grounding and connective ways by which people can relate to each other and where you see so easily visible is when you're dealing with pre-verbal circumstances if you have an infant that hasn't developed any language yet and you watch the interaction between that infant and the people that touch that infant appropriately or inappropriately, you, you, there's so much information available about what's going on. Right. And so I have two reactions to that. The first one is that this is actually a listener requested topic. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there and, uh, and a great topic it was. It wasn't something that I had originally thought about but then once this person had requested this I was like yeah that's so natural a topic and I'm surprised that we haven't talked about it already but then the second thing is uh, it is true that when we go to grad school we are taught don't touch your clients Um, where do you come down on that do you do you agree with that do you disagree I I agree so let me just say as a, a, a primer that I agree wholeheartedly it should never be to get the therapist's needs met. But if it isn't, how do you feel about that? Uh, like so much else in counseling, uh, it's a dangerous proposition. Mm-hmm. You go in a room alone with somebody and close the door, uh, anything can be said about what transpired in the room by either side. And it, you're personally and professionally at risk. Mm -hmm. You're volunteering to take that risk Mm -hmm. because you believe that there's quality and value in what you're doing and it it helps people. But you have to be very, very careful. And what we are trained is never to uh, touch someone in order to meet our own needs. Mm -hmm. If If I'm listening to your story and it's a painful, horrible story, and the humanity in me calls out for me to reassure you by touching your shoulder, your elbow, your hand, your your knee, whatever, I'm not supposed to do that Mm -hmm. unless I can read through your nonverbals that you could welcome it or unless I ask you. Mm -hmm. And that's so artificial. I say, may Mm -hmm. may I touch Mm -hmm. you? I feel the urge to hug you, but, you know, that's probably mine. Mm -hmm. And it may well be, and it Mm -hmm. probably should be mine to feel that urge. It's not mine to respond to it. All the power and all the privilege and all the right remains with the client. Right. It, you cannot be invasive. Yeah. You cannot be uh, domineering. You you cannot work to satisfy your own emotional needs through the interaction with the client. But there are times when the client needs that contact and that reassurance. Uh, and I don't know that it's illegitimate to give it to them. Mm-hmm. You just have to spend enough time with them mm-hmm. to work out how that dance is supposed to, to go. And I would never... Uh, well, I shouldn't say never. I, I refrain from touching a client, and I actually encourage other people in the room 
to not touch people when they're having an intense emotional reaction because it's a, a reaction that we have to try and comfort them, but it's really because we're experiencing empathy and we're feeling that emotion and right. we're like, okay, this is kind of uncomfortable for me, so I want to reassure you so that I can also feel reassured. And I think that it's important for people to be able to sit with the power of their own emotional reactions. Or, or it's manipulative. It's dominant. It's controlling. Uh, yeah. It limits the message. You know. Well, I think it does limit the message. I agree 100% with that. I don't think it always is down. I mean, and, and nothing is always. Uh, but I do think that, yes, it's a manipulation in that the individual probably feels uncomfortable with the expressive emotion. And so they themselves are trying to tamp it down because it's overwhelming for them. Well, and that's why this is a hard conversation to have. There are so many qualifiers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing family counseling and you got or a group counseling and you have a lot of people in the room, the interaction, the interplay, the power dynamics between them, the roles they play... And how they play them, you know, in uh, the alcoholic family, you mm -hmm. have these roles that people play, like the hero uh, or, or the comedian uh, or the toucher. And, and sometimes the dynamic of the pattern requires someone to touch someone. I, I mentioned this story before in some of our other podcasts. I was working on the family one time, a couple of teenage kids, a parent and a, and a, mom, a mom and a dad. And... Uh, the eldest daughter was sitting sideways to the dad mm -hmm. and whenever the dad would start to speak the dog would reach out and touch his knee and the family never noticed but the dad would stop speaking and so after i had spent a couple of sessions with him and i recognized that that appeared to be a pattern i asked about it and everybody immediately said oh no that didn't happen it didn't mm -hmm. happen that's not what's going on and i said okay would it be acceptable if i think that i'm seeing that that i just stop everything and say i think did that just happen because i it's really uh, important to me to hear accurately and see accurately so they're like yeah 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 so i kept pointing it out look you're touching his knee now you just touched his knee do you, are you aware that you touched his knee are you aware that she touched you what does that mean how do you understand it and pretty soon the whole family dynamics changed because they had to recognize that you can hear my we're, we're doing this from home dog. well <laughs> you know it, it's become uh somewhat uh ubiquitous we'll now go touch that, him. that that you know uh people are working from their homes and then their animals make it into their recordings uh so um did they get did the family ever get to the point where they accepted that that was going on and they accepted that that was uh either a conscious or unconscious attempt on the part of the daughter to control the message of the dad well as is often the situation in family counseling uh, there were ritualized formalized roles that everybody played and that window gave us an opportunity when we began to recognize that to identify that roles were being played and people could begin to understand what their contribution was mm -hmm. what their response was supposed to be how, mm -hmm. how this thing was supposed to work and that that was a way to mask an understanding uh, of what was really going on underneath the mm -hmm. role mm -hmm. and so then we had a breakthrough and we were able to recognize that people felt radically different then they were presenting themselves to be in the looking good mm -hmm. family because mm -hmm. it was an alcoholic family and one of the rules is we have to be the looking good family and and did did you was your interpretation of that that the message that the father was presenting was so threatening to the integrity of the family that she felt like she needed to stop him or that by his speaking he would disrupt the presentation of the looking good family and so she needed to to Belay that. Well, it's been many years, and I don't know that I remember all of the nuances, but my yeah. my memory is that his role in the family was to be the strong, silent type mm. who was prim primarily disengaged from family interactions. Gotcha. His job was to go to yeah. work and bring home money. Yeah. Their job, the other three of them, was to play all the music. And so when he wanted to pick up an instrument and play, they kind of indicated, mm -hmm. no, he, he should just be quiet. But they didn't do it directly. They didn't say, don't speak. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. But they did it non-verbally non mm -hmm. through touch. And 
you know, the, that story so perfectly illustrates one of the points in the article that I sent you that is amazing to me that we are aware of mm. as therapists. We are not sure other people might be aware of, but that is the idea that uh, we read so much nonverbal information right. from the touch that we receive so we can actually... Well, and for other, other things, too. The look, the glance, the right. body posture. Right. I mean, there's so many So we know the nonverbals, yeah. right, right, right. But, but, but specifically touch, right. that just by the way the, that a person touches you, by the feel of that, the pressure, the way they touch you, where they touch you, that you can read a tremendous amount of emotional information from that and that then begs the question if you exist in a space where you are not being touched like if you are quarantining as we are today in 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 the pandemic times and you are not getting regular forms of touch what are you losing well and there also are real concerns among professionals about the amount of abuse that's going on Mm -hmm. because of the quarantine and people are trapped in a home together Mm -hmm. and they they can't get away to to get a a relief and so they they descend into violence sometimes Mm -hmm. but but the point i wanted to segue into was we have also done a lot of reading and a lot of study in our field about attachment theory Mm -hmm. and uh, infants who have the available supportive mother figure, the object, uh, how it's called in the literature. It's not always the mother, but that's the the role identification. Uh, And the mother that is emotionally available and supportive and responsive to the needs of the child touches the child, holds the child Mm -hmm. in ways that the child feels supported and made safe. And the mother that is not emotionally available Mm -hmm touches either doesn't touch the child at all the child child just cries Mm -hmm. or she touches him in a way that's cold and distancing and awkward and the child doesn't feel safe Mm -hmm. or embraced and so that we believe is if you follow that particular orientation is the uh, fundamental uh, beginning of emotional psychological behavioral problems Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, oppositional defiant disorder starts there Mm -hmm. and so as we at least understand those theories when we talk to people we try to to peel the onion to get back to that basic level of attachment Mm -hmm. and how one is attached is it a power and dominance attachment or or dis uh, detachment Uh, or is it an affectionate supportive caring attachment Mm -hmm. where, where you feel safe and you feel loved and just casual touch and i'm not talking about Mm -hmm. all of this at least for the purpose of our conversation is non-sexualized touch right and uh i remember uh desmond morris wrote a book called the naked ape Mm -hmm. in which he Mm -hmm. was an anthropologist who did studies on man as an animal and in and he has another book out called man watching which is a really classic book uh but in man watching he he interviewed multiple cultures, and he has a silhouette uh, of a man and a woman, color coded for the areas that are safe public touch, mm-hmm. in you know like the shoulder, mm-hmm. the elbow, mm-hmm. the hands, the kneecap, uh, and areas that are not safe or appropriate touch. And there are patterns in human societies that mm-hmm. reflect all of that, and you can see it. Mm-hmm. And so then you 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 watch and you see is that what's going on. And the relationship with these people. Mm-hmm. After World War II, uh, there was some really phenomenal research that was done by Spitz, who looked at uh, infants who were in orphanages. So we yes. don't we don't have an orphanage system anymore. We have a, a foster care system, but back then we still had orphanages. And in the orphanages, uh, the caregivers at that time were told not to hold the children because they didn't want them to uh, develop to attach. attachments. Yeah, right. and 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 they would give them all of their needs. So you 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 would change the diapers, you would feed them, you would keep them warm, make sure they were swaddled, had blankets, whatever. But don't pick them up and just hold them just to to hold them. And 
what they found was that the brains of those children that were not held were changed and yes. they were changed for the worse. So they developed what is today called pervasive developmental disorder, what back then would have been called mental retardation, which is an out of vogue word. So I'm right. not right. I'm saying it because it used to be a thing. So don't crucify me, but now it's called pervasive developmental disorder. And uh, that was very real biological damage that was done to the brains of these infants just because they weren't touched. So um, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of Americans were adopting children from Russia and mm. Romania Don't that I came from yeah. those rigid orphanages mm -hmm. where they were abused, if not literally physically uh, abused. They were abused emotionally by the isolation, like mm -hmm. the Bryce Harlow monkey mm -hmm. experiment. And many of those kids, when they were adopted and then matured to be seven, eight years old or older, really developed emotional problems and behavioral problems because they never six they had attachment disorders that interfered with their ability to function uh, and i have to tell you you know my uh, wife and i adopted mm -hmm. a child in missouri mm -hmm. uh the child's 26 now but when we were going through the adoption God, process what they what they told us is in missouri which was pretty adoption unfriendly mm -hmm. at that time in missouri you can't get this child immediately It'll have to go into foster yeah. care for as much as six months to a year. And you can have regularly scheduled bonding mm -hmm. meetings where you go and visit in the home where the child is staying. And you can hold and touch the child so the child will have some sense of who you are. And fortunately for us, the child was not born in Missouri. It was born in Illinois. And in Illinois, which had the superseding authority mm -hmm. you could have a child from day one from the hospital mm -hmm. so we had that baby from the hospital and were able to hold him all that we wanted and needed to and all that he needed from us and it was a such mm -hmm. better place to be i mean mm -hmm. the, the idea of six months to a year of scheduled bonding visits every two or three weeks right just is abhorrent to right. me so we probably could uh, make the distinction between what's called bonding and what's called attachment. All right. So in bonding, that is a biochemical response. So nowadays, when I was born, this is what happened. My dad took my mom to the hospital and left yeah. and went to work and didn't come back for literally three days and picked us up from the hospital and took us home. Nowadays, that isn't I'm obviously. smiling because my father did the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and birth was a surgical procedure. It was in a sterile room. Uh, and sometimes, I don't know about that yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, it, it was even, you know, up until so many years ago, but, yeah. uh, and so, uh, but the baby was separated from the mother mm. at birth and cleaned up first and yeah. then brought to the mother's room after yeah. she was cleaned up and the baby was cleaned up. Nowadays, we don't do that. Nowadays, we take the child straight out of the, the womb, whether it's through cesarean section or through natural birth. And the first thing we do is place the child in skin to skin contact with both of the primary caregivers if they are present. So whoever is going to be the primary caregiver for the child. And the reason why we do that is because we know that that instantaneous skin to skin contact causes a biochemical reaction where oxytocin levels in the human body exceed their highest doses any other time of your life. So oxytocin, which is a hormone that is about pro-social behavior and, and attachment, is, 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 is really essential during that period of time. But the more that the infant is touched, the higher the infant's oxytocin levels are and the higher the oxytocin levels are of the primary caregivers when they are holding the child. So that's a really important thing that happens and it's biologically coded and that's why we can actually have physical damage done when we don't have it. So then it's later a, we go into attachment and we don't have to throw, a, run through that whole it's process. It's a human corollary. Mm -hmm to what in lower order animals is called imprinting. Yeah. There's a window of time where the newborn animal looks around and whatever it sees mm -hmm. becomes its mother. And so if the if you have a baby chicken or a baby goose or something and you imprint it to a puppy, it'll follow that dog around mm -hmm. thinking that dog is mom. Uh, or it can imprint to a human being or to an object. It, it, whatever it sees becomes mom. 
and in a much more sophisticated level, the biological interaction that you're talking about is similar to imprinting in lower order animals for human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we know that this touch is so important because it causes a biological change inside of us when we're infants, but that's also true when we're adults. So when we don't get touched as adults, there is a cost that we suffer in relation to that lack of physical contact. Well, it's also subject to so many variables. I mean, the, the father may not be present, may not, may not physically be present. Right. Yeah. And so therefore is not there for that opportunity, but also the mother may not be mm -hmm. emotionally present mm -hmm. if she has a severe enough abuse mm -hmm. history, uh, or if the, the existence of the baby is potentially threatening to her quality of life or her, her very life, and she may not be able to emotionally bond with that mm -hmm. child. So then that magic moment doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Even, even if she holds him, I mean, right. if he's placed on her breast right. or in her arms, uh, doesn't happen. That's right. And so in those situations, what will happen is that the child's oxytocin levels probably go up, but the mother's oxytocin levels do not. Yeah. And she's got all of these progesterone and, and cortisol, all these stress related hormones that are in her. And the child actually can smell that. Yeah. And so the child will then react to the actually the endocrine response of the mother and the child will the child's levels of oxytocin will drop and the child's stress hormone levels will rise and then that causes as you said before you know what we call now oppositional defiant disorder conduct disorder uh, even all the way up to reactive attachment disorder right and so that is a real thing that happens when we're children but as adults we also experience this lack of human contact and that's what I'm concerned about right now is how many people are alone physically alone or in a situation where you know in the beginning of the pandemic we heard all of these great stories about oh it's bringing us closer together we've never been closer in our relationship and then and now what I'm hearing and what I'm reading is oh, we've kind of drifted apart. We Everybody's living in the same house, but they're living in a different room. And everybody's doing their own thing because we're in survival mode. And I think we're losing that sense of connectedness. Now, maybe the holiday season will help to re-infuse some connection. I, I, I hope that that's true, but I don't know that that's true. And I am hearing my clients talk to me about the fact that the that this sense of separation or the reality of separation is really starting to wear on them. Also, I think it's important to encourage people to trust their sensory understanding or feeling, and regardless of the words they've been told. You, you know your mother loves you, you know mm -hmm. your father loves you, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've talked to any number of females in my career who have reported to me that they have felt slimed mm. by sexualized attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've talked about things like overt and covert sexual abuse. Covert means that nothing physically happened, but the uh, secret look and aura that's mm -hmm. radiated, they, they can feel that, they mm -hmm. see that, but then they're told by their caretaker, uh, no, you're crazy, Uncle Joe didn't do that. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel mm -hmm. that way. There's something wrong with you. What I would say to people is trust it. Trust it if you feel it. If you feel the coldness, if you feel the distance, if you feel the sexualization of the energy, then you need to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to take care of yourself, whatever that requires. So then what I'm hearing you say is that there are times where physical touch can be a negative. And, yes, absolutely. And people need to be aware. Yes. So we don't want to encourage just people touch just randomly. run out and touch yeah. everybody. Yeah. Because, yes, there are yeah. times where that's not a good thing. And, you know, it, to me, uh, that is a very specific example where the touch is all about pleasing the needs or satisfying the needs of, of one the individual. toucher. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is never probably the best way to be touched. Yeah. Even in a relationship 
right, a mutually committed relationship, that touch should always be partially about the receiver and not just the, I don't want to say perpetrator, but, but the, the doer. Um, and so ideally that would be the case in all of the good touch situations. Anytime it's just about the person doing the touching, it's probably not good. Well, and that's why there's such danger in ritualized role relationships like a priest and mm-hmm, a child mm-hmm. or a scoutmaster and a child or a teacher and a child or a counselor and yeah. a child that has to be acknowledged as a potentially fraught mm-hmm. with, with danger and, and abuse. Mm-hmm. And those of us who are in those professions have to be trained to, to know what we're doing and why we're doing it and to know what's appropriate and, and helpful and what's not. Right. And primarily to know that the fundamental requirement is if you're in that role, it can't be about meeting your needs. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have a fight with my wife and I go into a counseling situation and there's a client there that I feel emotionally Mm -hmm. attached and supportive to, that's a vulnerable position for that client. And I Mm -hmm. can take advantage of my distress either way Mm -hmm. to to make it a harder, colder experience because I'm mad or to make it a seductive experience. Uh, inappropriate experience because I'm needy. Mm -hmm. So I have to be trained to be cognizant of that and Mm -hmm. and to learn how to. And that's why counselors need to always be in some kind of supervision. Mm -hmm. They need to go and talk to other counselors about, I have this client and I'm feeling these feelings and I don't know what to do with that, Mm -hmm. how to understand it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or this client's approaching me this way, how do I understand that? How do I know? Supervision is critically Mm -hmm. important. And so this is tangential, but uh, it's never a problem for us. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about, w- would you say that uh, ongoing insight-based psychotherapy is similar to, if not takes the place of the supervision? No. Okay. No, because the supervision is about doing it as a professional, in a professional way, expanding your understanding, expanding your skill sets. The insight uh, psychotherapy is about healing your own self, your own wounds. But if, if you're if you are if you are consistently challenging yourself to heal your own wounds to be aware of you, your own stuff, you can't be an impartial observer of your own behavior. No, 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 no. I'm just, but but you don't think that that the insight based psychotherapy helps you to be cleaner? It might, but I think you still need mm. the supervision and the skill based uh, interaction mm-hmm. that says the foremost responsibility is to be a professional mm-hmm. to do this right for the client you have your own issues everybody has their issues yeah you work your issues in your therapy you work their issues in their therapy I, you know i, I just uh, i i hear what you're saying but i just disagree no 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 and and and, and i'm i'm you know i tell people all the time because the 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 reality is and and this is for some people uh, a, a glimpse behind the curtain pay no attention to the man uh, there's so few people who engage in regular supervision, especially once they've been doing it for five or 10 years. Uh, and so what I would say to people is you got to do something. If it's not supervision, it's psychotherapy, but you got to do one or the, you got to do something. If you do both, that's great, but you got to do something. You know, I've enjoyed this relationship with you since I was in graduate school. And so I don't think I've ever operated without several people in my life that I've had these kinds of clinical conversations with on a regular basis. Right. But I know a lot of people that don't have those regular conversations. That's disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you probably know too, but, uh, but, but it, I know, I know many who do yeah. and have. Yeah. So, it's yeah. A, so the, the, the truth is that people, they're, they're really good therapists and there are some who are operating. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Their, yeah. Especially if they are agenda-driven therapists. Yeah. Yeah, I got a point to prove. I know something about humanity. Let me fix you because you got to fit that pattern whether you think you do or not. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, most of the time, agenda-driven therapists would be in tremendous denial about whether they're agenda-driven. Oh, absolutely. So that's that's the, that's one the of the rub. ways you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that our takeaway from this is that by and large touch is a really positive it's even a fundamental human necessary need. thing yes. but there are times when it can be detrimental and even hurtful 
and it's important for people to be able to have good boundaries but to also be open to the opportunity because we can get to a point where we just operate in a space where we haven't been touched in a long time and we just assume that that's the way it's supposed to be and it isn't and it is important for people to give themselves permission to be open to the possibility that somebody in the world wants to touch them in an appropriate way it's an uphill slog I'm sorry. It's an uphill oh, slog. Uphill slog. Yeah. I thought you were referencing an author. I was going to say, I'm not aware of this person. <laughs> no. No, yeah. it's just a hill to climb. Yeah. There's so much uh, predetermined positioning that goes into right. the topic. Yeah. Uh, and yet, it is it is such a fundamental human need. But like so many fundamental human needs, it is subject to abuse. Mm-hmm. So you have to go go carefully. That's right. All right. Hopefully this has been enjoyable for people who have been listening to it. As always, the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And you can go to the YouTubes and get us there and actually watch the recorded version of the show. You can get us on TikTok at Psych with Mike. You can like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. But please, if you do nothing else, go to Apple Podcasts and find Psych with Mike there and subscribe and give us a rating. That is so beneficial for the show. As always, if it's Friday, it's Sunday.